Good morning. Well, I guess I'll be the first one to give y'all a little report on the men's retreat. It was amazing. I had a blast up there. Jesse did too. Brother Dennis, I'm not so sure about. Uh, but it was definitely a it was a blast. I'm really looking forward to when we get the next time to do that. But, you know, can't always have that. We always got to face the real world. And here we are again. On a Sunday morning, you get to listen to a 17-year-old give you a devotional. No, it's not. It's not all right at all. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to turn this morning to John chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 12 through 13. It says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no, th- have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. One of the biggest things that we're taught is to love each other, to love others. No matter what they've done, no matter how bad of a person they are, we're told to love. Here. That's hard to do sometimes. <laughs> it is hard to do. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. I can say that much, Willie. I'm guilty of that. I still hold grudges today. I still do. And I'm not supposed to. But again, it's that sin nature that causes that to happen. It's something that we fight every day. Those grudges and that hatred that we have towards others, though, we're supposed to let go of. Jesus said that this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. I'm sure Jesse's really happy now, by the way, because this is, this is his favorite verse. And he loves this verse. And I love this verse, too, because this is a daily reminder for me. That Jesus has told us that we are to love one another. Brother Dennis didn't tell us, Brother Jesse didn't tell us, I didn't tell you, the world didn't tell you to love each other, Jesus told you to. But he doesn't end just, he doesn't end it there. He goes on in verse 13 to say, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. What an amazing friend we have in Jesus, that he was willing to lay down his life for someone as worthless as me, for someone as worthless as Brother Jesse, Brother Dennis, everybody in the world. That he was willing to lay down his life, to put all the sin of the world upon him, to hang up on a cross for something that I did. He loved us that much. I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to lay down my life for others. Because that terrifies me. To put all that on me, thinking about all that just makes me lose my mind. How painful that must be. But I don't have to do that. Because someone already did that for me. He put it on him. To wash me white. To wash my sins away. To drench me and his love, and everything like that. And now all I have to do is acknowledge him as my Savior, to let him have control in my life, just to give up a little bit just so he can make it a little easier so I could have a second chance with him, to be with him, 
to get to see him, to get to lift up his name in praise and worship for eternity. Love one another as I loved you. And again, like Willie said, that's hard to do. I fight it daily. I'm sure Jesse does as well. I'm sure Brother Dennis does. Willie, I'm sure you do it too. But at the end of the day, you're supposed to let go of those. That hatred, you're supposed to let go of and replace it with love. And while that may be hard, it's something that we're supposed to do. Because while the world didn't love you, there was someone that always wanted you and loved you more than anything else that the world could offer you. And that was Jesus. What he was willing to do on a cross for me, I can never repay. But what I can do is offer him my life, my servitude to him, so others can come to know him. And just because he loved me, makes me love him even more. That he loved someone as worthless as me. Someone who was deep in my own sin. But he pulled me out of it. He gave me a second chance. And I'm glad to say that I took that chance. And now here I am. Almost five years later after I dedicated my life to Christ. Now 17. Surrendered the ministry. About to head into college. In a couple years. Getting to think about that's scary now. Holy. <laughs> but despite all that fear that I still have in my life, I know he's going to get rid of it. He's going to have his way. And he'll make it easier for me. But the real question is for you. Do you know how much he loved you? I shouldn't say loved. I should say how much he loves you right now. All it takes to know him is to follow him, to take up your cross and follow him. Because he loved you that much, to take up your cross that was meant for you. And he died for you. He loved you that much, and he still does. He still loves you today. He'll love you tomorrow. He'll love you the rest of this week, the rest of this month, the rest of this year, the rest of your life. And all it takes is just to give up a little bit of control in your life just so he can show you how much he actually does love you. But that choice is yours. Because I can't do it. Brother Dennis can't do it. Jesse can't do it. Your mom can't do it. Your dad can't do it for you. Your sisters, your brothers, they can't do it for you. It's a personal decision. That love is waiting for you, though. That infinite love. That merciful love that he showed us. But it's your choice to follow him. And I'm praying that you make that decision before it's too late. Thank you. Have we had any birthdays this past week? I don't believe so. How about anniversaries? Okay. Today we, during the 2 o'clock service, we're going to be calling members or having the, doing that again. And then next week we'll be in the intertestamental period. Um, and go. So this week during the 2 o'clock service, we're going to be going through the member role. And then next week will be the intertestamental period. Oh, yeah. The introduction of New Testament. Sorry. Next week we have men's and ladies meetings. And then not this Saturday, but next Saturday is the ladies conference. Do we have any other announcements?
Do we have any prayer requests? Michael Wood has cancer. Brother Dennis's mother has surgery this week. Any unspoken? Anything else? If not, I'm going to ask Brother Willie if you'll pray and dismiss us to our Sunday school classes. I'm sorry about my thing right there. Good morning. I'm happy to see you. Welcome to Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. I think we got a little treat this morning. Jerry is taking up the did Jerry take up the offering? Are you done with the offering? I guess we need to get you a cross. Everybody needs one. And if if there's some extra, will you do that? Thanks. Everybody gets one. Everybody gets one of these. There's enough for everybody. Just every, everybody gets one. It's part of the message. Oh, he already gave them to you. So, uh, oh, there. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Nova. Nova. Nova didn't get one. Today's a brand new day. Aren't you glad his mercies are brand new? Welcome to Sunday school. heard about uh, 
Mike. Did you, did you say his name is Mike? Mike? Michael Wood. Let's keep praying for him. Yes. And uh, let's keep praying for Roxy and Leon and Mary and Mary Poteet. And there was another. Oh, yeah, brother. Brother Dennis's mother's having surgery. What else? Pray for Ray and Gail. There he is. He had been sick. It, well, they, uh, in kindergarten and first grade, and even second and third grade, they don't know how to throw up. I hate to say that in front of you, but little kids don't know how to throw up. And they have been sick. Let, let's keep praying for Israel. Brother Mike, will you pray for us? Amen. Amen. Well, we're studying First Thessalonians, and Paul's written this letter to a young church that he had started, but he had to leave very quickly, and he didn't stay long at all. Remember, some evil men had got an angry mob after him, and he had to get out of town at night probably to save his life. And so Paul wrote this letter. He wants to encourage them and to instruct them and even to commend them because this church is doing very well. That's right. The Holy Spirit's with them. This church is doing very well. And look, they're growing and they're working for the Lord. Even though Paul just was there for a short time, this church is doing very well. Uh, and we talked about the reason, Brother Travis is right, the reason that they were doing so well, the Holy Spirit was with them and they were motivated by their love. They had a love for God. And they had a, and when they had a love for God, it, 
permeated them so that they loved others too. And, and Paul had left an impression on them and Paul said that they had left an impression on the people around them. The, this new church was even an example to other places. They were spreading to the gospel to places all around them. Yeah, because he was afraid that something could have went wrong because he had to leave so quickly. But everything went right. And, and this, young church, this young church, without much help from Paul and the other church leaders, were doing these things because they were letting the Holy Spirit work in their lives and they loved God. That's, they loved God. They, they, they knew that their, that their only hope in salvation is Jesus Christ and they knew that their only ho hope in serving Christ is through the Holy Spirit. And look, that's an encouragement to us, right? And so that brings us to this week's lesson. And we're on in chapter 2. Uh, I'm on page 47. And I love your comments, okay? Keep them coming. So, verse 1 says, For yourself, brethren... Remember, Paul's writing, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. Okay, he's talking about himself. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Remember, Paul was on a missionary journey, Paul and Silas, and then Timothy some. Verse 3, for our exhortation, exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. N nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Boy, Paul writes, if you know about English, he writes with prepositional phrases, okay? He just writes prepositional phrases over and over and over again. But let's see if we can break this down, okay? Paul's uh, hard to read, right? Because we don't talk like that. We don't talk with all those prepositional phrases. So uh, it's getting close to summertime, right? You ever get those uh, emails or those phone calls or those invitations for these vacation packages? Look, you can get three days and two nights, and it's free or it's really cheap, and all you have to do is go to that 90-minute presentation. Have you ever got a message like that? You can come here, sometimes it's Branson, sometimes it's somewhere else, and all you have to do is that 90-minute have, have you ever been to one? I have. I've been, I've been there too. And, and look, that 90 minutes turns into about two hours or three hours. That 90 minutes does. And look, that whole time. And look, if, I'm not against them, okay? I'm not trying to knock them because some people do enjoy that. But that whole time that you're there, okay, they're trying to sell you something, right? That whole time time they're trying to sell you something and look they make you feel like if you don't buy this you just the dumbest person that there is and we can't they can't understand why you don't just give them your checkbook right now 
Okay, your debit card nowadays. And then if you, if you, after the two hours is up and you're saying, look, time's up, they get so mad at you. They get so mad at you like you've, you've, you've done something against them. Okay? So look, that, that whole deal, they had a motive, right? They, they had a motive behind all of that, right? Yeah, money, that's right. Their whole motive was to get you to invest, right? From the moment that they that you accepted that email or that phone call, their motive was to get you to invest. Paul, in this very difficult passage, is saying, we didn't have those bad motives. Our motives were pure. Okay? And let's see if we can figure out Paul's motives. Paul, Paul didn't try to flatter them, okay? Sometimes, you know, they flatter us, right? When, when I went to that presentation, that 90 minute, I had, a, I had a Christian shirt on, so they were ready to talk to me about Christian. They said Jesus would even take a vacation. I thought, boy, y'all don't know Jesus. He didn't stop. for, He didn't ever take no vacation. But... Paul didn't try to flatter these folks. He, di he didn't try to manipulate them. He didn't try to deceive them. Okay? That's what he's saying in all those prepositions. He didn't flatter them. He didn't manipulate them. He didn't deceive them. But by the power of God, Paul says, he boldly spoke the truth, and it's the truth that does not change. He, he didn't come with flattering words trying to please men. And he uses the, the phrase cloak of covetousness. He, he didn't use a cloak of covetousness and a cloak of covetousness, it's an underhanded way of getting financial means. What Brother Travis said, it's, it's about money. So what Paul is saying, I didn't come in there with a cloak of covetousness or I didn't come in there scheming to make money. We, church people wouldn't do that, would they? So uh, Paul said, we didn't do that. We didn't, come in, we didn't come in to you scheming to make money with this hidden, with, a, with something hidden. A hidden fine print, right? We know the word fine print. Paul said, we didn't do that. Paul, Paul said, we didn't even come. If you look at verse uh, 6, as the apostles of Christ, Paul says, we didn't even come with the authority of an apostle. Was, was Paul an apostle? Did he have authority? Like he had authority that was given to him from God. Okay? Absolutely, right? Yes. So when he came to this group, this people at Thessalonia, he could have said, look at me, I'm an apostle. You better do what I say. He didn't do that, right? He came in a very humble way, right? He said he didn't even come with the authority of an apostle, but Paul came preaching the gospel, and Paul had one motivation, and that's to please God. That was his motivation, right? Paul's motivation, I'm going to come and preach to these people because my motivation is to please God. That's what Brother Travis is trying to say. Paul 
Paul had a, uh, the word that they use is zeal, right? Paul had a zeal that he wanted to please God. Much like he had a zeal before he was saved, when he got saved, he had just as much zeal to please God. Because he loved God. Yeah, that he had an attitude of a servant, right? That's when he got saved. He had the right motivation, right? He was motivated by his love for God. He was motivated that he wanted to serve God, to please God. He was a servant. That was his motivation. And he, all of these other things that we have to put up with out in the world... None of that stuff was his motivation. That's what he's saying in these first verses. And this writer says, we can take these, uh, take this chapter, and it can really teach us about pastors, preachers. Uh, this writer says, there's a number of reasons someone might decide to become a pastor uh, an easy job. Some people would say that a pastor, being a pastor, is an easy job. Here's a pastor's wife. We might better ask her first. Uh, somebody might become a pastor uh, for the prestige. Being a pastor, they might think it's a prestigious job. She's not agreeing with anything I'm saying. Uh, oh, she can't hear me. Oh, she forgot her hearing aid. Boy, I can say a lot about Betty now. Okay, she can't hear me what I'm saying. She can't hear what I'm saying. You know, I'm being, uh, uh, I'm being mean. Because Betty don't, wouldn't, if Betty could hear me, she would say, I don't agree with none of that. Okay, Brother Cleo was not in it for, because of the easy job. If you know Brother Cleo, right? He wasn't in it for prestige. He loved the Lord. Uh, some people might become a pastor for the money to be gained. I'm sorry, but pastors don't make money. Kind of like teachers. Now, so there are people that do. Right? But here's what the writer said. There's only one reason to become a pastor that God called him. That's the reason to become a pastor. That's the reason right there. God calls you to be a pastor, that's the reason you become a pastor. None of those other reasons are even real reasons. Now the world, the, these worldly people might be getting these things, but a, a God-called pastor doesn't do it for those things. A pastor is a position of ministry, just as Paul ministered. But I'm even saying, dude, these are good things for a pastor, but this is good stuff for us too, right? For us that ain't pastors, this is good stuff for us. Go and come right back. Seriously, go, come right back. Okay? So this is good stuff for us. Let's keep going, unless there's something else. Verse 7. So Paul's saying, I didn't come with all these under-hidden motives. I came for one reason, because I was serving God, and I love God. And verse 7 says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Or we could say, even as a nursing mother cherishes her children. We, we were gentle among you, even as a nursing mother cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. And we could replace that word souls with lives. So he said, we were willing to impart unto you not the gospel of God only, 
but also our own lives because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Uh, this writer says, it takes a love for others to minister effectively. If we want to minister effectively, like a pastor or even us, it takes a love for others. And some people are difficult to love. But, and he says Jesus even commanded us to love. Even our enemies. So well, let me ask you. It, it, if it takes this love to minister, how do we love others? How do we love others so much that we share the gospel with them? And even like Paul said, we not only share the gospel with them, we share our lives with them. How do we love people like that? Especially if we don't even like them that much. Norma said, this comes from God. Would you say that that our love for God would keep us motivated? So, who's telling us to love? God is, right? And if we love God then that's the motivation for us to love others, right? I know you may not hear her. She said, if God put you in this ministry, ministering to others, are there other ministries besides pastor? Sure, absolutely. We could even say that we all have a ministry, right? When we walk out of here, we all got a ministry somewhere, right? She said if we get put in a special ministry or in a ministry, that God's going to give us love. That God get, Can God give us love? He's, he, he, he's got so much, he's, it's just running out of him, right? He's got so much love, it's running out of him, right? And when we, st st when we stop loving ourselves and we start loving him, that's when we can love other people, right? It takes love of God, right? Is that that, is that, that, is that, that agape love? That's that agape love, right? That's that supernatural love, godly love. My wife loves me, okay? But nobody loved me like my mom. Right? Can you remember? Nobody loved me like my mom. And, and, and look, Paul, Paul said, we loved y'all like a mom loves their kid. Nobody loved me like my mom. And 
that kind of love comes from God. Right? And it, when, when, when we love God, that can keep us motivated to love others. And that's what Brother Travis is saying. We love them so much that we're going to take time to share the gospel with them. Even though it's scary and it's uh, hard, but we love God so much that we're going to take time and share gospel with the other people. Right? Look, here, here's what this writer says. God's going to bless that, right? Because it's God that's telling us to do that, right? Here's what this writer said. When we love others, he says, with grace, our words are with grace seasoned with salt. And what that means is we're, we're supposed to edify. We're supposed to build others up, not tear people down. It's easy to tear somebody down. It's hard to build somebody up. But that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to build people up. We're supposed to be comforting in our correcting and reassuring in our rebuke. Like Paul was, right? He said, but we were gentle among you. He could have come in there. He could have said, I'm an apostle, and you guys are a bunch of worthless, idol-worshiping sinners. I don't even really have time to be here. I'm leaving. I'm much higher than you. But he didn't say that. He loved them like a mom loves their kid, and he treated them with gentleness, right? He didn't change. He didn't change his message, right? He still preached that we're sinners saved by grace, right? But he had that message was seasoned with gentleness. And he even worked, right? He worked day and night for these folks. He worked for these folks. Uh, this writer says Paul worked hard ministering to them. But he also worked for his own living. He took no wages from them so as not to be a burden unto them and to become chargeable of just being in it for the money. So what is he saying? We shouldn't pay preachers? No, he's not saying that. Should we pay preachers? Yes. There's much, much, much written about that, right? So remember Paul was a missionary. That's why we pay missionaries. Right? If a person is a missionary, the people that the missionary is ministering to, they may or may not be responsible to pay. But we should sponsor missionaries. Is that right? So, Paul said, I didn't take any money from you because he was there as a missionary. Now, if these folks call a pastor, they should start paying that pastor, right? Providing for that pastor. Make sense? How long is a, church, how, how long is a group of people a mission? I don't know. Okay? That's the big question, right? Brother Early's a missionary. How long is that group of people going to be a mission? I don't know. But I, I, I know that he started a church in one city, and they called a pastor, and they're, we're not paying that guy, right? They're paying him, and he's moved on to another group of people. And if he leaves them and they call a pastor, they need to pay him. But Brother Early's a, a That's the way missions work, right? And that's what Paul said, right? We didn't make this stuff up, right? Paul said that, right?
<laughs> he is. So, but Paul did all that stuff because he loved them, right? He, his motivation was love. Verse 10. You, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and just and unblameable we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that ye walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard in us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Uh, he said, we, we loved you like, like a mom, and now he's saying, we loved you like a dad. And sadly, in, in our culture, dads are gone. And my dad was gone, by the way. But... A dad loves in a different way than a mom. Is that right? That's why God designed it. And by the way, God didn't design mom and mom and dad and dad. God designed a mom and a dad. Okay? And look, they both have, they both bring something to the family, right? They both bring something to the family. And, and, and so... Look, I've been a, a dad for a long time. And Paul said, we loved you like a dad. And this writer says, like a father, concerned for his children, Paul exhorted. Well, we don't use that word, okay? And so the word exhort means urge. It's 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 this right here. You're pushing them up. I'm urging you to volunteer. Has anybody ever done you that? When they say, "Who's going to volunteer?" and you do this, and the person left up there, the urging means this: that somebody's behind you, pushing you up. Okay. So we got a picture of a mom loving their baby, but now we got a picture of a dad pushing you up. Uh. When Jonathan was a little kid, I, I pushed him under the house and he helped me get something. This weekend, I pushed him up on the roof to go up there and caulk my chimney. Look, I, you, you urge them to do things, right? You're, a dad urges them, right? He's a lot better up on the roof than I am. So, <laughs> he urged them to walk worthy of God. And, and look, re real fast. We Here's what David Jeremiah said. We, we, we have the righteousness of Christ, right? When we got saved, we were justified. We, yes, we were justified, okay? So when God sees us, we, he sees the righteousness of his son. That's positional justification. Practical justification is I'm going to try to live my life to match what my position is. And Paul is urging them, he's exhorting them to live their life in such a way that matches who they really are Positionally. It's what James said. You, you say you got faith. I'm going to show you my faith by my works. It's uh, verse 12 says, He urged them, he pushed them, so that they would walk worthy of God. It is 100% about the Holy Spirit. I believe that. But we also 
because of our love for God, we should be motivated to walk worthy of, of God. And, and he said, we're so thankful. We're so, so, so thankful that these words, he said, these aren't really my words. He took these words not as the words of men, but as the words of God. The, Paul said, they're not my words. These are God's words. And the writer says they received Paul's preaching and teaching not as the words of men but as the very word of God Paul could see that, th that this faith in the word of God was working in them to give them strength and patience and comfort in the midst of all this suffering and so look that, that, that tells us there is power in the word of God right that's why I love Sunday school, right? It's not about me, my God. It's, it, it's about God's word. It's about this, right? There's power in his word, right? That's so that's why I love Sunday school, because we've got to study his word. There's power in the preaching of God's word, right? There is. And Paul said, you accepted that. What else before we go? Yes. 